Good evening. I'm Tyler Domsky. I'm the pastor here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. And we are gathered here for a Monday Thursday service. Now, Monday Thursday is a contemplative service. It is often a service that takes place at night, hence the darkness. Uh, and so uh, even if you're um, viewing this during the day, um, know that this uh, reflects the beginning of the passion narrative. And uh, so in that sense becomes a more contemplative service. So this will be a, a shorter service with some music, uh, with communion, and with uh, some scripture reading and some uh, consideration of the scripture. Uh, one of the things that we invite uh, as we take communion together is that you would take whatever elements you have around the house that you can use for it. Um, the very use of wine and uh, bread by Jesus is not to do something extravagant or sacramental. They were just regular items. They were items that were served at every meal. Uh, wine was the standard beverage because it was uh, safe. Uh, often the water was not safe and bread was the staple of food. And so uh, anything that you have around the house that is a staple, if you have wine and, and bread or, or wine, uh, juice and bread, uh, even if you have crackers and water or cookies and milk, I guess, if you, uh, if that's where you want to go with it. Uh, but anything works for um, the communion that we're sharing to do together today. Case in point, I am going to be having bread that is a hamburger bun and juice that is water because I ran out of juice. So anything works. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, gather up your things. It'll be a little bit before we get to communion, but let's join together in worship. We're happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Please pray with me. 
Almighty God, on this Monday Thursday, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to the new covenants that you offer for us, a new promise, a promise to be in relationship with us, a promise that you are with us, a promise that you love us even in spite of our rejection of you, even in spite of our inability to fix that relationship, that you love us anyway, and that you reconcile yourself to us doing something that we could not have done. Help us in this moment to recognize the relationship that you have with us, the relationship that you long for with us, that there is uh, nothing that can separate us from your love and that you are inviting us into a deeper relationship. Help us to see that in this moment. Help us to know your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading tonight comes from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is Mark's version of the Passover meal, of the, um, the First Communion, the Last Supper. So, uh, hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, first, the, to let you know, the, the Passover meal um, is a meal that is told often, uh, the Seder meal, which is uh, a more contemporary understanding of it. Uh, the Seder meal is, is told with food to tell the story. Um, the Passover meal was a little different than the Seder meal, but it still would have been symbolic, uh, using food to tell a story that the lamb that they eat represented the lamb of the Passover, um, the sacrificial lamb. Uh, and so the fact that Jesus is using symbolism within the food of communion uh, is indicative of, of the tradition that they're a part of. So know that that is the context in which this is happening. So hear these words from uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 10 and forward. Judas Iscariot one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to give Jesus up to them. When they heard it, they were delighted and promised to give him money. So he started looking for an opportunity to turn him in. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples came to Jesus. Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? He sent two disciples and said to them, go into the city. A man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Prepare for us there. The disciples left, came to the city, found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. That evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. During the meal, Jesus said, I assure you that one of you will betray me, someone eating with me. Deeply saddened, they asked him one by one, is it not, it's not me, is it? Jesus answered, it's one of the 12, one who is dipping bread with me into this bowl. The human one goes to his death just as it was written about him. But how terrible it is for that person who betrays the human one. It would be better for him if he had never been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I assure you that I won't drink wine again until the day when I drink it in the new way in God's kingdom. After singing songs of praise, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, You will all falter in your faithfulness to me. It is written, I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if everyone else stumbles, I won't. But Jesus said to him, I assure you that on this very night, when the rooster crows twice, 
you will deny me three times. But Peter insisted, if I must die alongside you, I won't deny you. And they all said the same thing. Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to feel anxious and despair. And he said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then he went a short distance further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, he left them and prayed, repeating the same words. And again, when he came back, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know how to respond to him. He came a third time and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, here comes the betrayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I want so dear. Almighty God, open our hearts, open our minds. May your word be found in my words. Amen. So Mark's uh, version of the Last Supper is briefer than all of the other Gospels. Uh, Mark is traditionally the brief one. but really puts emphasis by being so brief and cutting out some of the details. There's no foot washing in Mark. Um, It does really emphasize the interactions that Jesus has with his disciples. Uh, He is 
knowing that they will betray him, knowing that they will deny him. And Peter, uh, lovable Peter, uh, God's golden retriever, um, immediately says, I would never do that. And we all know Peter, uh, and so does Jesus. And he says, I, even if everybody else does that, I would never leave you. And Jesus tells him, well, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. And Peter doesn't believe it, but we know that that's what's going to happen. It's always interesting as well that Jesus doesn't name Judas as the betrayer. So his acknowledgement that someone is going to betray him is less about uh, pointing out G Judas and more about communicating something to Judas that is private between he and Jesus at that point. That Judas knows that Jesus knows who he's talking about. Jesus knows that he's talking about Judas, but nobody else does. And that's an interesting connection. The betrayal of Judas is that he leaves the community, that he steps away from Jesus and he abandons him. And we see in a moment that that's the same thing that everyone else does. So they uh, have the Passover meal and Jesus institutes a new covenant in the midst of this um, in the act of communion. As I said, food is often used to tell stories, to tell histories, to understand where people come from. We still do this today. We um, prepare our grandmother's dish uh, or our grandfather's uh, um, recipe for the, the, how to cook a, uh, something on the grill. We have uh, desserts or special things that, that come from our families or our heritage or um, just even our new traditions that we've started. Food is important for us. It's a, it's a memory um, signifier and that good food can remind us of who we are and where we've been. And so it is not an accident that Jesus uses food to institute this new relationship, this understanding of this new relationship with God. But to the disciples, it's just a regular meal. Despite Jesus telling them over and over that he is going to die, uh, they still don't get it. And it's late. They have been uh, eating a Passover meal, which is a very full meal. And they start singing songs and singing praises to God. And then they walk up the hill to the Mount of Olives. And uh, it really is up. It's a, it's a pretty steep climb up. So this is, uh, the dinner would start late in the evening, around nine or so. And the, it takes several hours and they're drinking wine throughout the meeting or the evening. And so they're, it's late at night, they're tired, they're full, and they've been drinking some wine. And so they're going to be very tired. And then they walk up the hill. Jesus is upset and his friends don't notice. And he says, I'm really upset. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to die and I don't know what to do. So can you stay up with me? And then he goes to pray and he asks God if there's any other way. Let's do that. But I still will do whatever you need me to do. And then he goes back to his friends and they've all fallen asleep. And this happens two more times. And it even says that they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know how to respond to what Jesus was doing. And then the Judas comes with the, uh, the guards from the chief priests and all of his disciples leave without exception. They all run away. So the suffering of the passion doesn't start on Good Friday. It starts on Monday, Thursday. And that's important for us to recognize because most human suffering is not physical. There, although there is, there's tremendous physical suffering in this world. Most of it is psychological. Most of it is emotional. Most of it is anxiety and despair and abandonment. 
that Jesus is experiencing the most human of experiences of uncertainty, of not knowing what is going to happen, of anxiety, of not wanting to do it, and of abandonment, of asking for help and having friends who do not understand and then run away. This is a fear that I think most of us have at, at our heart. Um, I've often recounted the, the story of uh, my kids when they have gotten shots for vaccines and things like that, that um, one of my kids in particular really does not like shots. And it gets to the point where it's overwhelming and um, really struggles with getting the shot. But the problem is not the shot itself. The problem is the anxiety that leads to the shot. I remember when I was younger and I didn't like shots, it wasn't the the actual point of the injection because that only lasts for maybe a second, a one, 1,000, and then that's it, if even that. The anxiety comes from knowing that that pain is going to come, knowing that it will not feel good. And that anxiety can last for minutes, for hours, maybe for days, if you, if you dislike it enough. I know that um, when my kids are upset about it, that they are upset about it going when they see the doctors come on the doctor's appointment, come on the calendar. And that is the heart of human suffering is not the actual pain. It's the fear of the pain. It's, it's not the actual uh, rejection so much as it's the fear of rejection. And again, there is pain in the pain and pain in the rejection and pain in, in all of that. But the anticipation of something being bad oftentimes eclipses the actual event. And so for Jesus to truly be human, his suffering has to represent the greatest of human suffering, which is uncertainty, which is anxiety. Part of what is so beautiful about this experience is not that it's beautiful that uh, Jesus would suffer, but that what we can see in the cross, as we've been looking at throughout this Lenten season, trying to figure out what the cross means for us. The cross in this story means that that fear and that anxiety and that sense of abandonment is being redeemed by the cross, is being fulfilled by the cross, that no longer should we feel the anxiety of death, the fear of death, because death has lost its sting. No longer should we feel um, a sense of uncertainty, a sense of unknown, because while we don't know what's in store for us tomorrow, we do know that we'll be okay. We do know that God is with us, that we don't have to worry about whether or not God loves us or accepts us, but that God has shown that love and acceptance to all people for all time. And that we don't have to feel abandoned, that God calls us not to personal piety or to personal devotion, but to community, to care for one another, to live together, to, to do so in a way that is both joyful and costly, but costly in a way that is good. And so this season, this night is a reminder that even though we are still people who get anxious, we are still people who fear, we are still people who feel that abandonment, that all of that is temporary, that God has experienced all of that too. God knows what our suffering is and God redeems that and God will fix that. That the reality that we are moving towards is a, is a place without fear, without pain, without anxiety or abandonment. And then in the midst of this time that we aren't just waiting around for that to happen, but that God is helping us to see that that suffering is so great 
and we have the power to help others in the midst of the now to not experience that level of suffering, to not be abandoned, to not be anxious, to not have the uncertainty. We can be advocates for one another that as we live into community, then we are with one another. All Jesus asked his, his friends to do was just be with him. He didn't say, what do I do? What's the answer? Because they didn't know the answer, but he just said, please, I am upset and I just need some friends. Can you just sit with me? Most of the time, that's all we need. We don't need someone to fix something that we know can't be fixed, but we need someone to sit with us, to remind us that we're not alone and to acknowledge that our pain is real, but that it won't last forever. That's what this night is about. One of the many things that this night is about, that God has invited us into something bigger, that God's reconciliation for the world is not simply salvation, but it's restoration. It is restoring the community that God intended for this world, where we can live together in peace, that we can rejoice in creation, that we can live as people without fear, live as people without rejection, live as people without anxiety, that we don't have to worry about the shot that's coming because there's no need for shots, that we don't have to worry about the people that might abandon us because there's no need for abandonment, that we're all drawn together in Christ. Let us look forward to that day, but let us also be people who reflect that future reality right now. Let us be people who seek out and to, to partner with our friends in need, our neighbors in need, our siblings in need, all, all who are alone. Let us remind them that they are not by themselves. Let us sit with them in their pain, even when we don't know what to say or how to respond. Let us be people of compassion. Let us be followers of Christ. Amen. As we turn to the sacrament of communion, uh, if you need to pause your video, now's the time. Get whatever elements you have and let's join together in communion. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share this feast for which he has prepared. Please pray with me. Gracious God, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and of the cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share in this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And now we pray the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. I invite you all to take the bread and let us partake. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of him. Again with the cup. This cup is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink ye all. Please pray with me. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but you still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for this world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful in every time and place. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So that concludes our service. Oftentimes, um, when we have a Monday Thursday service, we uh, will have a tenebrae. A tenebrae service is the service of diminishing light. And so we end the service in darkness. We started this service in darkness and we end it the same way. And so I invite you to consider um, the cross. Consider a God who loves us so much that he would experience the depth of human emotion, that he would seek to understand what it is like to fear. And that that God heals us of that and draws us into community that we might not be alone and not fear the unknown because there is nothing that can harm us because God is with us. So let us leave this place. Let us go into a world that is filled with anxiety and fear, filled with uh, those who have been abandoned, filled with those who need community who need grace and who need love. Let us be the hands and the feet 
and the friends willing to sit for those people. So let's go. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.